took a family vacation uh, for the first time in the pandemic, and uh, we decided to go up to Big Bear, which is uh, a mountainous lake uh, at the edge of the Sierra Nevadas. It's really gorgeous for California. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's about two hours from LA. Uh, we drive up, we, we're doing biking, we're doing hiking, we're doing boating, we try some kayaking. And this is fun, we're all, we're all about an eighth of a mile off the shore. We're, we're, by, we're, we're, we're doing, well, I'm doing voices, I'm making the whole family laugh. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I do not know how this happened. Keep in mind, I'm an eighth of a mile off the shore, right? Yeah. There's, there's nothing nearby me. Uh, I, who am leaning forward in a kayak to row, so your shirt, your t-shirt kind of lifts up a little bit, exposing a little bit of the belly, or in my case, the massive six pack, you know how it goes. Yeah, yes, right. yes. On, on the side of my belly, there's that sort of muffin top area when you're leaning forward in, in, uh, in, uh, on, a, on a kayak. Yeah. I do not know how this happened, Brad. Wasp attacked my little stomach area that was exposed when I'm a mi- an eighth of a mile offshore. Wasps and plural? There was several wasps? Wasp? Wasp plural. I do not know how this happened or why they decided to attack me an eighth of a mile offshore away from everything. <laughs> my only thought is that they must have been hanging out on the boat because the fact that they attacked me low means yeah. they were probably on the boat and crawled up or, or did something. Anyway, I flipped out. It hurt immediately. <gasps> You, if you've ever been struck by wasps, it's like oh. it's a different kind of a, a sting than a bee. And wasps can sting you several times. It's not yeah. like a bee where they sting once and die. They can sting no, you it was, over it was and over. Tat, 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 along oh, that like soft God. little underbelly on the side of, the, of my uh, t-shirt there. And so I scream and I gr- I literally grab them and throw them in the water. I'm like, ow, 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 ow. And uh, <laughs> I, who had been singing songs and doing voices with the family, I'm oh. suddenly like apparently very very cussy. I was like, ah, oh, God, son of a blood, God, oh, 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 oh. And I don't remember this, but the whole family delights in telling me this. Apparently, my wife was like, all right, turn around, everybody. We're going back to shore. We're going to get daddy some some wasp, uh, that, like, cream you put on for wasps. And I'm like, apparently, I said, no, I'm fine. We're having family fun. Oh! This is fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I am not going to be the reason this family fun ends. Uh, I'm not ruining this. And on that note, I'm going to say hello, oh everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making happy comics all through wasp stings. And making a ouch. Oh, I'm sorry. And a wasp here in the studio and making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc., and I'm his pal Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the comics documentary Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And a big reminder that this show is going out live right now to our VIP members over at Comic Lab Live Gab. If you'd like to join us, you can join us at the $10 level at patreon.com slash comic lab for that. And a huge shout out to our sponsors and friends over at Wacom at WACOM.com, the makers of the Wacom One, which Brad got used in Big Bear this <gasps> weekend. I, I was going to ask whether I, I was going to uh, ask whether those wasp stings impeded your uh, ability to use the Wacom One. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, they did not. Thankfully, they Good. did impede my ability to look cool in a kayak. Yes, but uh, they did not <laughs> impede my ability to. Uh, 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 no, I was fun. I did the I did the morning coffee. We're out on the deck, staring out at uh, you know hundred year old pine trees. Yeah. It's just me and a hawk circling overhead and. I've got my flannel on and I'm cartooning on the deck. It was delightful. It's delightful as heck. It is nice. I've done, I've started doing that on the back deck. It's just taking my stuff out there, the Wacom one. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to work. It's really nice to get out of the studio sometimes. It is. And the Wacom one helps you do it. It's a nice change of pace. And frankly, uh, people need to hear this more and more. When I FaceTime Brad, he's out cartooning on his back deck, which is delightful. Yeah. A, you're getting value out of that back deck, which was yes. a whole uh, thing that we were working on. And two, you're using the Wacom One, which is awesome. Anyway, so a huge shout out and thank you to Wacom and the makers of the Wacom One at W-A-C-O-M dot com. And Bradley J., what's our first topic for the day, my friend? Oh, my gosh. Well, the first topic I've got is I want to go. I was listening to our show from uh, a couple weeks back. And it was the one where I was dealing with writer's block as I was trying to give people creative advice. 
And if you remember, I would start off very, very optimistic. <laughs> as I would go, it would just go right down the tubes until at the end, uh, as you kept pointing out, I was just a, a, a ball of misery. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it is really amazing how that that can really uh and that can get you down. That can that can uh, that can permeate everything. And I'm telling you, this was a this was a. Usually, I can write uh, a chapter, uh, or at least do the first portion of writing uh, in about a week. I usually take a week off, concentrate on that, get my structure in place, and then go back to uh, you know the 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 weekly production of the comic. Right. Uh, this I was stuck for two weeks I, of spinning my oh, wheels. Oh wow! It was two weeks. Oh, it was two solid weeks. And, and what oh, you heard Brad. was near the end of that. I, I would, after recording that show, I still had a couple of days where I really couldn't put anything together. And then I did something and oh, well, go ahead. Can I ask you real quick though? What, yeah. The fact that it went to two weeks, A, is, uh, intru- introduces its own kind of panic. Yeah. But did you did you try to go down to the Acme and get a, uh, a case of Dr. Hidalgo's <laughs> Lugubrious Cherry Soda? Or was that not available at the Acme? <laughs> at the Acme, we we were not able to go to the Acme and get any lugubrious soda. As we're about to find out, uh, there were some shipping concerns with that, and uh, <laughs> and we we were the the, the 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 shelves were bare of Doctor Hidalgo's lugubrious black cherry oh, soda. <laughs> this pandemic, it takes it, it takes, doesn't it? Oh, oh, oh I'm so bright. Really Sorry does. about that, Brad. It really does. But uh, but yeah, so this is uh, so what happened is uh, what I finally did to get out of it was something that uh, really can be best described as going back to basics. Now, at this point, I've I've got to say that I've actually kind of experienced a version of this in the past to the extent that I actually have a note written in my sketchbook that kind of reminds me, uh, and, and by the way, this is on the oh, first page on. of the sketchbook. I, Brad, Brad actually scanned it and faxed me the note in the book. Here, hold on, let me just yeah. read it real quick. It just says, bills are due tomorrow. That's the note. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> get to work, get to work, dummy. Yes. That's the note. Yeah. yeah. No, what is you the don't note? have the luxury of uh, writer's block. You, uh, you got to get moving. Uh, no, so I have a certain number of pages that I do Xerox, uh, and I... Uh, tape and paste inside of the first several pages of every new sketchbook because they're things that roll over. Yep. Yep. There are things that roll over and there are notes that I've made. There's notes well, on. on the so cast. that in a way, though, that's sort of a makeshift Bible, isn't it? In terms yes, of in terms yes. of writing tips to yourself, in terms of character things to remember. That's interesting. I guess that I never you... thought of it that way, but I guess I I have been building a Bible because the number of pages keeps going up and up and up <laughs> that I have to transfer into new sketchbooks. So I right. guess you're right. In a way, I am kind of building my own Bible. How many how many photocopied pages are there now? Oh, at this point. Well, at this point, I'd say seven, seven or eight here. OK, that's getting substantive. Seven or eight pages yeah. is not nothing. And it's basically just notes on like uh, notes on the characters, things that I want to remember as I'm writing these characters, things that are important also, just like uh, I have a, a schematic of the floor plan of the office and who sits where so I don't inten- unintentionally move them around all the time. Like, so, oh, I remember when you did that. You made the schematic. To somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I I when it comes to like Sheldon's house or the ship in drive, I'm always like the doorway goes where it needs to go. Like I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm much more in awe of you planning out the schematics of like, nope, the window's over here. One of the notes that I've got in one of those early pages in my sketchbook that I transfer to each new sketchbook is a note that says, remember, story is character with a want or a need who faces an obstacle. Yeah. Just that, those, that little like algebra, A plus B equals C. Yep. Uh, Whenever I'm stuck in, and this is, this, this isn't like necessarily punchline writing or, you know, humor writing, but in story writing, whenever I've been lost and, and out to sea, uh, floating in, uh, on a kayak and a river of no ideas, <laughs> as it were. And, and the wasps and the wasps of pain are, are hitting you in the belly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
And, and what happens is I'm focusing on the storylines and the plot points that I want and, and in some cases need to uh, that next chapter to cover. Like, I, I'm like, okay, now this character has to be here by the end of this story. This other thing needs to happen. And I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? I don't know, right? I'm, I'm looking at big picture stuff. Right. Time and time again. And that's where the problem happens. That's where the writer's block happens uh, because none of those suggested obvious pathways. Uh, and so I stagnated. There were no storyline pathways that were burning to be told that allowed mismatch to be in this part, in this new place in her relationship with Captain Heroic. There was no place for Desi to find out uh, that her days on the planet Earth were numbered. Uh, There was nothing there. I knew those things needed to happen. Right. But I didn't know how it was going to happen. And I sat there literally, by the way, part of the reason I'm doing this show is to remind myself if I listen to this show later, (laughs) because I I, I forgot to look at the page. (laughs) I didn't look at my note. I forgot the note was there. And I'm I'm, uh, for a week. I'm like, oh, my God, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Uh, and, but so and now what and, does what does looking at that page trigger for you? Because is it is it like, OK, return to basic truths about the characters? Yeah, is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so I, I, I wrote out the details of each of these overarching character paths, what one person's goal was, what another person's goal was. But they didn't suggest any storylines. Finally, I went back to the basic. And, and, and that is character with a want or a need who faces an obstacle. Okay. And once I started, literally, once I started doing that, I sat down and I say, okay, what does mismatch want in this next section of the story? What does right. she want or what does she need? Uh, and then I answer that question, what's the obstacle? And then uh, it was like, okay, that really didn't give me anything. But, but what if I take that same relationship and took it from another character's point of view, Right. What is that character's want or need? And what is, and maybe in this case, mismatch is the obstacle, right? So now I start taking that relationship and I'm uh, looking at it from each different character's point of view and, I, and asking myself, what is this character's want? What is their need? And what's standing in the way? All of a sudden, things start to fall into place, right? Yeah. And yeah. I've got, I've got, and, and I need, I, I, I like to do an A, B storyline. So the story keeps shifting between these two storylines until we get to the end of the chapter. And then best case scenario, some way those two storylines collide. I love doing that. Oh. I think it's a satisfying ex- experience for my readers. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, it, it doesn't always happen and it doesn't always happen as strongly as I want it to happen. Right. But when right. I can make those two storylines that we've been going back and forth from collide at the end of a chapter, then I know I've done my job as yeah. a writer. That, I, I that, that is, I, that is a very satisfying feeling. That's actually my uh, penultimate goal with drive is to have before the story wraps up, have the six or seven different storylines all come together uh, yeah, kind of, kind of in a, a sort of an epic way. You know, any any epic story always has the six or seven travelers or the six or seven storylines coming together in the one kingdom or this or that kind of thing. And yeah, uh, that's yeah. So I can see how satisfying that would be from a chapter standpoint. But what what one thing I want to talk about though is uh, I want everybody to note that Brad was saying like I would walk down a path and say, okay, I have the character, I have the want, yeah, I have the you know the limitation, I I have the goal that they're trying to get to. Um, and what's funny is that's always the moment where my in-laws walk in and there's a bit of drool on my mouth and I've got the thousand yard <laughs> stare because yeah. what I'm actually doing is I'm gaming out how the story could go like a oh. chess master thinking about six steps ahead. Like if I write yes. this, then these pieces will come into place and then that will eventually have to build to this. Nope, that won't work. Let's go back to stage one. And so I can I can imagine you in your studio gaming out. Well, if I take mismatch in this dra- angle, this is how the story is going to go up. Nope, nope, nope. Got to go from a different character because yep. you're always yep. sort of thinking ahead. OK, how am I going to do this 20 pages from now, not two pages from now? And that's always when my wife walks in, looks at me staring out the window and says, oh, I thought you were working today. 
<laughs> hey, hey, that lawn still needs to be mowed. Hey, how about that trash taken out? Yeah. Um, it's like you don't realize I'm working my ass off. <laughs> it just doesn't look like if that's I think that's the uh, the the biggest uh, uh I don't know, is kick in the in the nuts that there is with being a writer is that you can be absolutely fighting a life or death struggle and somebody can walk in and say, "Oh, I thought you were going to be working today." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a version of it's a version of I know this is a, a bit of a stretch, but it's a version yeah. of that phrase, you know, be kind because everyone around you is fighting a battle that you'll never know. Yeah. yeah. In a way, that's true with writers is that in their mind, yeah. they're fighting a battle that's 30 pages on. And oh that's why it's 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 this quiet. They're sitting perfectly still. Nothing is happening. But they're imagining uh, uh, imaginary fights and conflicts and battles and, and emotional struggles 30 pages from now to game out whether it's working or not. And and it's always funny right. to walk in on somebody right at that moment because it looks yes. like they've just had a stroke, you know? Yeah. So now I've so now I've I've come up with an A story concept and a B story concept. Great. Just okay, based good. on this character wants that, but there's this in the way. And I've got this for story A, and I've got that for story B. I still don't have a story. I just have a sentence. Right, <laughs> right. Right. I don't have a story, but now I've got a place I can go. Now I put that against my uh, uh, chapter template that basically says, OK, you'll do an introduction for three pages. You'll do a storyline A for four pages, storyline B for three pages. And then it basically is just an outline so that I don't go off in the weeds on a story, right? right. It just says, uh, here's you're going to you're going to get to this point by this page. You're going to introduce the concept. Then you're going to throw it to story B. You're going to introduce the concept. Then in story A, you're going to attempt to solve the problem. You get the idea. Yeah, it oh goes yeah. all the way through there for a 30 to 33 page chapter. And it's just how I keep myself organized so that I keep things moving. Right, right. Because right, right. I know from reading my old stuff, I can go in the weeds and luxuriate out in the weeds, right? I can go down a path and just follow this idea down. It, there's no storytelling going on, but it's Brad being fascinated with the concept of, you know, butterflies or whatever it is, you know, right. it's like, meanwhile, my readers are saying, Hey, there was a story. Come on, come on back. Tell me the story. <laughs> Get out of the weeds. <laughs> tell me the story. So for me, I like having that template because it keeps me on track and I yeah. need to be kept on track sometimes. So now I put that against the story and I'm, I just put that and I, uh, and I, and I just, again, I've, I'm writing nothing. I'm writing concepts. First mismatch says something to Captain Heroic about this concept. Right. No dialogue, no, nothing happened, but just here's the concept that's going to take place on page one. Right. Here's the concept that's going to take place on page two. And I put that against my template and then something, and now I'm actually writing. Now I've officially beaten writer's block, but there's something else I want to talk about. And that is I go through and I write kind of a version of what I want everybody to do and what I think the story is. This character experiencing a want, facing an obstacle, and maybe even uh, getting to the other end of that obstacle. Oh, so you say you are loglining the whole story before even yeah, writing I guess it's it. a lot. Like, yeah, because I'm is not the reason yet. why this story exists in a way, basically. Uh, is yeah, what you do. yeah. You're and then, and for basically, yourself. Okay. like, uh, you know, page three is going to be this action happens, but I don't know how the action happens and I don't know right. what they say. Right. I just know that this action happens. OK, uh, because it, it, because also I found out if you get too detailed right now. You're going to, again, you're going to be off in the weeds. You got to get this off. You got to get it at the meta level. You got to get it at the macro level. You got to get it yeah. from the bird's eye view and then focus in on the details. Yeah, if, if you want to use the metaphor of building a house, this is the stage of getting up uh, all the framing. Like you're just getting the framing yes, in place. Yes. We're not, we're not we're talking about faucets yet. We're just putting the framing in place, you know, that kind of thing. Now I think I've got my A story and my B story kind of roughed out and I put it against now as something, as something that I'm strongly recommending to my storytelling students for the past several semester. It's, it's called the story circle and Dan Harmon, who wrote uh, Rick and Morty and mm -hmm. uh, the TV series community uh, talks about this story circle an awful lot. And it's an eighth stage circle that just basically says uh, and I'll just go through it because I think it's worth talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, you start out with your character in the comfort zone. That's one. Two, there's a need or a desire. Three, 
they get put in an unfamiliar situation. Four, they adapt to that unfamiliar situation. Five, they get what they want. Six, but they pay a price for getting what they want. Seven, there's a return to comfort. Eight, but they've changed. Now, if I've written a story, I'll put it up, or and this just goes for this, like this B story in a chapter. If I've written that, and, and again, just concepts, I'll put that against the story circle and I'll say, now, what step did I miss? Did I hit, did I touch all the bases? Did I go through there and, and do the full progression? Because if not, I'm not saying I have to uh, it slavishly put something in there, but it points out maybe something that that story was missing that I didn't catch the first time through. Right, right. Do I need to give this character a moment of, uh, you know, remorse? Do I need to give this character a moment where they've changed as a result of this story? Uh, do, and, and so I use this just to show me maybe if I'm missing something in my story or some things that can make my story stronger. That's very clever. At this point, I I can go through and I've got uh, concepts written out for each page. And then at that point, the next week, I start working on the comic. I still haven't written a word of dialogue. I still haven't written out any actual scenes or places, but for each one of these pages, I know what's going to happen, what action happens. So then I when see I'm now why you describe week, this as a, a problem to be solved, because the way you write it was, it was, first of all, very different than I am. But yeah, if you take those 33 pages and line them up against uh, Harmon's story circle, which I think has what, like eight or nine stages. I don't remember when you eight, read them eight, out, eight phases. Yeah. So you're looking roughly uh, at uh, X number of pages to cover that stage, right? And then it is literally just checking off boxes in terms of writing. Like, well, they need to be sad here. They need to find revitalized hope on this next page, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, that's, that's a very clever way to do it because I see what you mean. You always say like, well, then it's just a problem to be solved. And I'm always a little bit taken aback by that because I was like, well, how is that a problem to be solved? But uh, I see what you mean now when you have a structure of the 33 pages and you know you're going to use the story circle to find completion of that story. Yeah. Um, it is literally just boxes to be checked off. And then the fun yep. part is filling out, uh, you know, bringing all that to life. That's my point. Now it comes to the fun part because now I'm on, I'm on week number one where I'm going to do page one and I've written out everything that needs to happen. Now uh, on Monday, I look at that or actually this will, this would be like Saturday morning out on the front porch uh, with my coffee. I'll sit there and I'll be, okay, here's what needs to happen. What's the most interesting way I can make this happen? Where's, where's the humor? Where's the joy? Where's the intrigue? And I will just write, you know, well, can I, I, this is for the sake of bringing this home. I'm just going to write, I'm going to read you what I had written for my first page, just uh, a basic synopsis of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on page one, uh, Desi receives a message from her home realm uh, via a raven where she's her she's told her time on earth is drawing to a close okay that's and there's a few other thing that needs to happen there but that's basically how the story opens okay. now i've got to say what situation can i put desi in where it's interesting that she's getting a message from her home dimension, which is like a, a, an, an a, a analogy for hell or Hades, right? Can I pause you for a second just to say that this past weekend, I also got a message saying my, that my time in this realm was also almost up. <laughs> I tried bicycling at 6,500 uh, 6, feet. And Brad, I about passed out a good mile into this bike ride. I was like, yeah. my lungs are not prepared to bike at 6,500 feet. Oh, God. Yeah, that's that's a pretty clear message. <laughs> so I also got a raven from the realm inviting me yeah. back. Your, your time on Earth is almost done. Anyway, keep going. But just to bring this conversation to a close, and and because we get a lot of people asking us about the writing process, that what was that's what was written on my page for page one, and I had to I had to sit there and think, okay, what's the best way to do this? Well, it turns out that for me in that moment, the best way to do this was to send Desi out on an errand, 
uh, to pick up some items for an incantation. So she goes to a version of a Philadelphia bodega that in this case is an occult shop and okay. cafe. Yeah. She has uh, an interaction with the cafe shop owner. Hilarity ensues for a page and the, and the whole thing is introduced. But again, I can't express this enough. It, a, a bodega was not on my sketchbook page right, for that day. Right, right. Uh, a, a, I had a, I had the guy behind the counter had tentacles for a mouth, you know, like a Cthulhu kind of character. Sure. Right. That wasn't on the page. Right. At what he's, it, it, they give her the wrong order and he says, Oh no, you've got a to go order. And he reaches under the counter and he pulls up a bag and the bag has a hole in it where something clearly chewed its way out. And he says, <laughs> Oh no. Your to-go order went. <laughs> and on the bag, and you know, like those convenience store bags where it says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you in red. Sure. And then the one thank you's in dark red. It says, curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you. <laughs> All of those dumb All of that, jokes. none of that was on the page, right? I get, yeah, none you're, of that. Yeah, All yeah, it yeah. said was Desi gets a message. And then I sat there and said, now what's the most interesting way to make that happen? And right, by right. doing that, by the way, I've got the next 33 pages charted out. Not a word of it written, but I can work on it week after week after week, because now all I'm doing is going to that next page, which I'll start thinking about Saturday morning and saying, all right, what's the most interesting way I can do that? Well, even though our writing processes are different, I have to say that that idea that, you know, you need to advance one thing on the plot or the story or the character development on the page, right? You have one note yeah. to yourself, Brad Geiger in his handwriting saying, you know, she gets a message. That's the note. I often have the same thing where I just say, I need to get out on this page that the uh, the such and such empire is crumbling, right? In, in my story. The, like that yeah. the humans are now realizing such and such empires crumbling, right? That's the one bit of exposition. But that's when the fun starts because I yes. I basically think that of that as a writing uh, exercise of like, okay, somewhere between panels two and four, I have to drop that bit of exposition. But all the fun stuff is the florid, unnecessary stuff that I'm writing around that to hide the fact that I'm advancing one bit of exposition or one bit of plot movement, right? Like everything, yeah. all the window dressing tries to hide the fact that you've just learned something in the story in a way, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, as, yeah. As, though, as though it wasn't intentional that you learned that because it was just, it was accidental to all this conversation that's delightful in the meantime. So uh, yeah. like you, I think it's fun. Like that's where the fun starts is, you know, you have to yes. do X, Y, Z to advance the story. Okay. Now have fun to hide the fact that you're, you're introducing X, Y, Z to advance the story. Yes. It, there's something sort yes. of fun about that. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you, but. Well, no, that's, that's really the culmination of it. I mean, and, and for me, I'm doing a full page that I release a half a page at a time. Right. And so since I want to always be building uh, an audience on the web, that means that there's got to be sign something significant at the halfway point. In other words, the last panel of the top half of the page. And there's got to be something significant on the last panel of the page. For me, since I'm writing humor, hopefully that's a punchline. Right. God willing, it's a punchline that connects with somebody, right? <laughs> but it could also be something significant, something surprising, a cliffhanger. It could be any number of things. As right. long as the person that's reading that comic for the first time or reading that half a page for the first time today doesn't really need to know what happened yesterday, I give them just enough in that first panel that they can suss out what's going on. And I'm telling you, it's not always easy. <laughs> and, 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 it, it, and, and you've got to be very careful about the way you do it. But I want to build readership on the web. So I got to do it because that's how my readers are reading it. So I give them enough to understand what's going on in that first panel so that by the time they reach that second panel, boom, they got something out of it. They, it was a significant reading experience. The good news is when you put that all together, that makes those pages really great to read because there's something happening on every page. There's yeah. you're not doing page after page of somebody walking through the kitchen, making coffee, doing this, doing that. You got something happening. That's interesting. Uh, I can't, I can't recommend it strongly enough, but all of that could not have happened until I literally after a week and a half of banging my head on walls, looking back at their first page in my sketchbook and reminding me myself, 
hey, dummy, it's about a character who has a want or a need who faces an obstacle. And yeah. until I went back to that, I couldn't work. I, uh, well, it, trying to wrap that up, I think, first yeah. of all, that's fantastic that you broke through the writer's block. Uh, as a friend, I'm, as my, I know that we joked about it, but I am genuinely happy that you broke through it. But I think there is tremendous value in reminding everybody that when you are stuck, when things aren't going uh, as you hoped, to return yeah. to basic truths about writing and that very often, or basic truths about a character. Who are they yeah. in that one word that you summarize for your, your own writer's Bible? Or who, who is the, what is the plot that you summarize in a one or two sentences for your story Bible? Just go back to that, reread that. And very yeah. often it, it triggers you uh, to, in, in ways that you hadn't been expecting when you were suffering through writer's block. So Brad, I'm so glad that that, that worked for you. Good work, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad to be on the other side of it. <laughs> hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. So, Dave, I've got kind of a good news, bad news uh, situation uh, that's in the news uh, that independent cartoonists should be aware of. All right. What's that, my friend? All right. So according to CNN, uh, and there's a, a headline here that says the shipping crisis is getting worse. And here's what that means for holiday shopping. This via CNN business, the vast network of ports, container vessels, and trucking companies that moves goods around the world is badly tangled. And the cost of shipping is skyrocketing. And that's troubling news for retailers and holiday shoppers. More than 18 months into the pandemic, the disruption to global supply chains is getting worse, spurring shortages of consumer products and making it more expensive for companies to ship goods where they're needed. As a matter of fact, in some cases, uh, uh, goods, here's one. Uh, I just want to jump ahead and tell you this. The world's container index shows that the composite cost of shipping a 40-foot container on eight major east-west routes hit $9,316. Uh, that was up 360%. All right. <laughs> another, another shipping yeah. cost from Shanghai to Rotterdam soared 659%. Oh. So, there's kind of a good news, bad news situation well, here wait, for independent the good cartoonists. News? What is the good news here? <laughs> because the good Brad, news is here's what I'm hearing. Uh, God <laughs> forbid someone else on this podcast might have twelve to 15,000 pounds of dry books that he needs to ship in the next couple months. God forbid that. So what is the good news? Because I want to throw myself off a cliff after this. <laughs> My joke answer was going to be the good news is I didn't do a Kickstarter this year. <laughs> I don't have the heart to say it oh god oh god i told Brad. my wife that this morning i said man i really dodged a bullet by deciding not to do a kickstarter she looked at me and she said decided it was dumb luck if you could have gotten a kickstarter together you would have done it i'm like yeah you're probably right no listen i i'm i've been very aware of this uh shipping problem especially as i've been getting quotes from different printers um but uh, here's the the bad news on top of bad news yeah. It's not something that's easily solved. Uh, no. Like this is going to be with us for about two, maybe three years, because part of the problem is certain containers aren't going back to where they need to get to, if that makes yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. And so because it's it's cheaper to send a ship empty and fast back to China so that it can make more money. But the problem is then you have a bunch of empty containers in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, and then there's uh, entire ports that are being shut down from COVID, like that the, the major one that got shut down in, I think it was, actually, I think it was Shanghai, the second port in Shanghai uh, got shut down. 
Uh, and yeah. then there's labor shortages and then gas prices are tricky for a lot of these specific vehicles. It's a mess for the next couple of years. It's not good. Yeah. Well, OK, so the, yeah, you're right <laughs> in that respect. What I'm saying is, it, uh, it's bad if news. you're going to kickstart it all in the next three years, there is no great time to do it because yeah. it's still going to be a problem is what I was getting at. You're going to get zonked one way or the other. The, the yeah. good news, I guess, is that you can kind of uh, keep your eyes open and and account for it in your Kickstarter yes. and pad yes. those shipping costs a little bit because you know uh, what it's going to be and you know that it might go up a little bit. So give yourself a little padding there. I guess the other thing I was thinking about, Dave, for our listeners uh, is this. Uh, if you heard the pro tips that went out uh, just recently, you heard me telling you, hey, if you're going to get merchandise out in front of your readers for the holidays, you need to start doing that now. In fact, right. I believe that uh, that pro tip just went out uh, today on the day that we are recording the show. It said, hey, Get your holiday merchandise now. Now, for the independent artist, knowing that shipping costs are going up, knowing that there's going to be supply problems, and knowing that this is going to happen around the holiday season, if you do have merchandise or uh, even services that you think are going to be uh, in demand around the holidays, or if you want to take a shot at that, this is the time for independent artists to really step up because... Uh, we're, we can we can step in and fill some of that void that mm -hmm. people are going to be looking at something saying, ah, geez, do I really want this? It, it, it went up 30 percent from the last year when I bought it or it's going to be hard to ship uh, it, it, from overseas, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there might be uh, a, a, a better, more fertile ground for independent artists, people might start looking to different places when they have trouble find, uh, filling their holiday lists and independent artists might stand to benefit from that. Either way, if you are of the mind of offering holiday merchandise, this is absolutely the time to do it. And uh, it's something that you should perhaps be prepared to really push that maybe even a little bit harder than you did last year. Well, yeah, I think that's a great point. And and again, as a friend, I want to say thank you for in, in, inducing an app, an absolutely bowel shaking anxiety on me, uh, as you remind <laughs> me of my shipping costs in the next I'm couple so months. So thank sorry. you, thank you for that, Brad. <laughs> thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Well, as you get your bowels under control, let's see if we can get a couple of five dollar Patreon questions under control. This one comes in from our Patreon backers, Susan Marks, who opens up their comments by saying. Yippee! I which I love any message that starts with an expletive well, it starts like with a yippee. yippee. Well, all right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you or a group of you are looking to self-publish comics, when and why should you become a quote small press? Unquote. Dave has a small press called Small Fish Studios. I'm a member of a community of cartoonists, and we'd like to publish anthologies of our work. I'm counting the days until November 22. I live within driving distance of Santa Rosa and cannot wait to see you all in 3D. <laughs> hey, we can't wait either, Susan. She says, thank you for bringing me joy every week. So, Dave, the question is small press. You go to comic conventions. There's a small press area. There's a small press expo. Uh, what, what qualifications did you need to satisfy in order to become small? press right the 40 point bullet points uh, that i had to check off before i could call yes. myself small press I, yeah. I let me answer this question by giving you an example inside yeah. my books in all of the copyright sections i say mm -hmm. uh, uh you know drive is is uh, trademark uh, small fish and copyright dave kellett Small Fish is a California arts corporation, right? And I've had more than one cartoonist email me and be like, hey, how did you file to become a California arts corporation? What's a California yeah. arts corporation? And I go, oh, that's a term I just made up. It's a corporation <laughs> that creates art in California. I'm a California arts corporation. But I just like the sound of it. I, I literally, as an artist, I just like the sound that my corporation was called the California <laughs> arts corporation. And I've had more than one. More than one person emailed me like, hey, how do I file to become a California Arts Corporation? I was like, doesn't exist, doesn't exist. Yeah. And that's a little bit how I feel about the phrase small fish or a small press. Yeah. 
It doesn't exist. It, it exists only in your mind in the sense that if that's the way you want to present yourself to the world, yeah. then you say you're small press. If you want to yep. present yourself to the world as an indie press, you say you're an indie press. If you want mm -hmm. to say you're an up and coming press, you say I'm an up and coming press. I, what I'm getting <laughs> at here is it's a little bit of zhuzh on, on nonsense, right. basically. It, don't you think, Brad? No, yeah, absolutely. You can be whatever press you want. If you're into coffee, you can become a French press. We're not going <laughs> to complain about it. But yeah, Susan, it's just a word. It's just, it it has no real uh, legal meaning. It, 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 it's just, uh, it's marketing at this point. Yeah. I, it used to have meaning at back when uh, publishers really controlled the, the landscape of comics uh, and print publishers were in uh, in the forefront of getting yes. stuff distributed. Then small press, those words had meaning. That was basically right. meant that you were a small company that was doing publishing and distribution. Uh, as of today, those words have no meaning whatsoever. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reinforce an underline for Brad that yeah. Small Fish in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when you were going up against Penguin and you were a mom and pop like a kitchen table publisher. Yeah. That's that's yeah. what small press was. Like the people that I'm trying to think of somebody like who was it that did the whole earth catalog? Those kind of people in the yeah. 70s yeah. or 60s. Those mm -hmm. were small press. But the the term has basically expired because the world moved yeah. on and kind of everybody became small press in a way aside from uh -huh. the big the big kids. Um, and then in a way, Brad, another section of comic cons, you often see the sign that's hanging over two or three aisles that says web comics. That's yeah. also, frankly, a term that's a little bit expiring because kind yeah. of everybody became web comics in a, in a sense. Yep. Um, and so uh, even though that still exists and everybody kind of mentally knows, oh, those are web cartoonists, you can still kind of include another 30, 40, 50 percent of, of working artists as quote unquote web cartoonists, even though they don't call themselves yeah. web cartoonists. So it's one of those terms which is, uh, like Brad said, it's a marketing phrase. It's however you want to market yourself to the world. Yeah. Yeah, the, the web comics one always gets me because I can see somebody reading comics on their phone in one of my storytelling classes at UArts. And I, I, I'll, I'll come up to them and this has happened, Dave. I said, oh, you're a web comics reader. And they go, what? I said, you're reading web comics. I said, no, no, I'm not. I'm reading webtoons. I'm a webtoons reader. I said, but yeah, webtoons are web comics. And they go, I don't even know what a web comic is. What right. are you talking about? Right, right. They that phrase didn't necessarily make it down to some of those younger generations. They call them webtoons. Right. They, that, that's what that and not or, only a title of the site they're going, but that's also the generic for all comics that are published on the web. And those are considered you webtoons. A, you talk to a different 16 or 17 year old to go, no, I'm just reading comics. I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. You know, you're Th right. That's literally all they've ever known. They've gotten their manga that way. They've gotten their American web comics that way. They've gotten their print comics that way. They're yeah. just reading comics on their phone. That's what they're reading. So anyway, yeah. uh, all that to say is it's, it's just a marketing zhuzh on top of however you are handling your business. Absolutely. Dave, you, you actually pitched a topic to me uh, earlier that I'm fascinated about. It has to do with the fact that, and, and this is how I love how you spend your spare time. You put <laughs> the, the word cartoonist into a search at the New York times and you were uh, jaw dropped by what you found. Well, you know what? Yes. Okay. So I, I had been trying to remember an article that I read a few years ago uh, about Facebook and cartoonists in the, in the New York Times. And um, so I typed in, in the little search bar in, you know, I have a New York Times account. So I typed in the search bar, yeah. uh, cartoonist. And I was fascinated to see, Brad, that the only times that the New I mean, 99% of the time, the only times that the New York Times writes about cartoonists is when they're dead. It's only <laughs> obituaries, right? It's never, it's never features. It's never featurettes. It's never like a profile of Brad Geiger. What does Brad Geiger do on a Sunday? That kind of thing. Yeah. It's never yeah. a, hey, here's the artist behind uh, X-Men or here's, oh, look at the, the top, you know, The Walking Dead was created by Kirkman and here's a, a, a like sampling of what his life's like. It's only when they die. And I find yeah. that fascinating uh, and kind of interesting to talk about in terms of how cartoonists present themselves how cartoonists yeah. market their work and the result in terms of mass media about how cartoonists are seen. Because if you're only looking at Charles, uh, granted Charles Schultz is an exception, so let's not look at Charles Schultz, but yeah. if you're only looking at say uh, a, a, cart a, a comic strip cartoonist when they're dead, a little bit, something went wrong there, you know, uh, I think, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think a little bit something so went wrong there, but I want to ask was? you, what's that? What, what do you think that was that went wrong? 
Well, I it's funny because I've, I've been stewing it over. And by the way, none of this really bothers me. I, 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 yeah. I, I it's more just a passing interest that I, I happen to notice it. But here's what I think it is, is that yeah. so many of us chose a career where we could essentially hide behind our art. We're mm -hmm. not, for the most part, this is very broad strokes, for the most part, cartoonists are not public speakers. They're not people that want to trot out onto a stage and grab a mic and be like, how's that? How's Cincinnati today? Let's hear <laughs> yeah. you, Cincinnati. You know, that kind of, <laughs> cartoonists tend to be like, oh yeah, I'm drawing over here in a corner. And I include yeah. myself in that for the most part. Yeah. Um, and so I think what happens is we promote our titles, we promote our stories, we promote our characters. We don't promote us. And frankly, yeah. because the money is so small in cartooning, there's not a PR industry that that promotes cartoonists in the same way that the writers, directors, producers, and actors of a TV show all at some point get profiled. You know, yeah. there's no there's no industry there to to basically fluff up who we are as a as a, a an artist. It's all focused on our characters. What do you what are your passing thoughts about why that might be? <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I think I think what happened is they they did a few of those profiles and they found people who were very insular, very uh, shy. And they didn't get good stories out of them. They didn't get, they didn't get, you know, hot quotes. They didn't get hot takes, you know, and they, and, and they, and they're like, oh, don't, you know, I can see them in a newsroom saying, oh God, don't do a personality profile on a cartoonist. They'll give you nothing. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not interesting. They're not going to jump around. They're not going to give you great yeah. uh, photos. They're going to, they're going to give you nothing. Uh, I could totally see that. Part of me also, having been in newspapers for 20 years, uh, every newsroom I was ever in, uh, the news, the, 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 the journalists, the people who worked the news did not like comics uh, at, at all. Yeah, that's because, true. That's true. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because what happened every year they did one of those, you know, hey, what are you reading in the paper? You know, what's your favorite thing about the paper? It was always comics and sports. And that drove journalists crazy. You know, what you, you you read the comics before you read the front page? Yeah, they're great. I love Snoopy, you know, uh, this this would get under their skin. So a part of me l wants to think that there's a little bit of that going on. It's like yeah. oh, comics. We hate comics. Uh, and part of it is I think they they had one too many clunker stories where, you know, the person they were talking to didn't give them interesting quotes, didn't give them anything that they could use. Yeah. And it just and, and I mean. Listen, a part of it, we've got to be, if we want to get that kind of coverage, we've got to be, uh, we got to give them what they want and what they need for doing good coverage. And part of it is just natural. Uh, some of it is like, and here's somebody listening to the podcast saying, well, listen, Geiger, I'm not going to jump around for a reporter, nor should you have to. But a story about someone who, uh, if your main story is, again, just like we talked about in the beginning of the show, your hardest work your absolute life and death struggle. Anybody can walk into the room and you you're staring out the window with drool on your chin, right? <laughs> That's a hard story to write yes, from a journalist yes. point. They're looking at that. They say, how do I make that interesting? How do I make that a story? You're looking out the window. The drool isn't interesting. How, what, we, how do I do that? We are literally the photocopy negative of the journalistic truism of if it bleeds, it leads, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> We are the opposite of adventure or sexy or, or uh, you know, out there moving kineticism, all that stuff. Uh, cartoonists are very often quiet, still sitting in a studio, very, you know, working yeah. very softly about your drawing. And, and you're right that that is hard to profile. There's no sexiness like there is on a TV set where there's cameras and lights and makeup and, oh, look at these people and they're all acting and, oh, look at, oh, explosions going off in the background. Like, that's fun to profile. It is, you're right, it is yeah. a harder thing to profile someone sitting very still at a small wooden desk. Yeah. And then the question comes up, well, well, how do we become better at that? How do we, how, what would happen if we became better at promoting ourselves and so forth? Well, think about it. There is one comic strip person who routinely gets a lot of coverage, but the way he does it, and it's not, it's, it's it, his comic is uh, uh, tangential. And it's not because of the comic so much as the wild politically charged statements, he says. And then it becomes a, a, a source of controversy and bad feelings a lot of times and a lot of lightning rod type of situations. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. And that person gets a lot of coverage as a cartoonist, but it's because of yeah. the stuff that he says that really makes people angry and, and it becomes that. Uh, I, I think there's a way of doing that without becoming a political figure, without saying outlandish stuff that might uh, get people upset uh, but it's going to be in the same vein. In other words, you've got to say something that's worth being talked about. Right, uh, right. And it's not necessarily, here's the comic that I drew. It might be kind of, uh, you know, some some of the things that Dave and I tell you to do all the time. It's not when you make a social media post, it's not here's my comic. It's here's how I feel about my comic. Here's why I'm proud of my comic. Here, right. Here's something about comics that brings me joy. Those are the topics. And as we see every day on social media, cartoonists are not used to doing this. They just say, here's my comic, which is understandable. You put a lot of work into that comic, but people don't want to see, say, here's my comic. They want to read about what about that comic making process gave you joy. And I think that's what we've got to do. Uh, we've got to share that part of ourselves if, if, if we're looking for uh, more coverage, which I'm also going to argue. I don't know that that's where we should be putting the greatest amount of our efforts. No, agreed. I like you. I'm enough. I'm enough of a shrinking violet where I kind of don't care and I don't want a profile yeah. written about me. Yeah. But I'm also kind of egotistical where I wouldn't mind a, a profile written about me. Right. But, <laughs> but here's a here's a cultural thing that I think is interesting. American yeah. comic corporations made us interchangeable in the sense that. If somebody was getting uh, uppity or asking too much money on X-Men, boop, they're off X-Men. Here comes a new artist. X-Men is still at the top of the of the of the page, right? It's it, it's X-Men. And then occasionally you'll have the tiny little names of the artists down at the bottom, like yeah. Jones, Smith, McGregor. You know, you'll see the. But what's interesting is that Franco-Belgian comics always put the name of the artist at the top of the of the um uh, the book and they always put the mm -hmm. title towards the bottom. And so for me with drive, I don't know if you've ever looked at my drive books, Brad, but I made a conscious choice to do the Franco Belgian style where I put Dave Kellett at the top and drive at the bottom, because I always thought that was interesting where, uh, the French and the Belgians always are like, no, the artist matters. The artist is important. Yeah. This is the, this is the thing that, whereas American comics are always like X-Men by Jim Lee, you know, that kind of thing. They always, <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. the corporation doesn't want to promote Jim Lee. They want to promote right. X-Men. You know, right. And so but whereas in the Franco-Belgian system, they're like, no, the artist is more important. This is the seventh art. This is a this is an important thing to have these cartoonists uh, uh, be celebrated. So I just think there's an interesting little cultural thing there, too, where yeah. American comics corporations have never wanted to push the artist behind the work. Because even like Charles Schultz, as we learned this week, there was a time when the syndicate was very willing to push him off of, of Peanuts oh. and bring in a Superman artist to draw uh, 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 Peanuts. Because of yeah. that contract dispute, you know, and so we all knew it. But to see the pages, it was painful yeah. to see somebody else drawing Schultz anyway. It really was. And that was Al Plastino, who was a Superman artist who they yeah. brought in uh, to try to replace him uh, right. if the negotiations didn't do well. Yeah, that was that was eye opening. Like I but said, you get in my what I'm tweet, saying, though, is that American co uh, comics corporations were always like, no, 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 no. The title is more important than the artist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even Charles Schultz, arguably the greatest cartoonist yes. of the 20th century. Even Charles Schultz was like, nope, you can you can be pushed out the door anytime, buddy. So keep quiet. That kind of thing. Yeah. That's and so amazing. I think I think that that is a little bit of a problem with North American comics versus Franco Belgian yeah. comics is that the artist is never celebrated. But anyway, all that being said, I'm enough of a quiet nerd where I I actively chose a career where I never have to stand in front of the camera if I don't want to, and I never have right. to be self promotional if I don't want to, and I don't have to be. It doesn't have to be about Dave. It has to be about. And I like that. So how about you? Yeah. As a little capstone, do you do you wish you could be more Brad Geiger's Evil Link or Evil Ink by Brad Geiger? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I would love, I would love uh, somebody to pay more attention to me because my mom was <laughs> right. Man. I'm a very special little boy. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no doubt about it. I'm, I'm endlessly fascinating. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, but at the same time, uh, 
I, I listen. The, I, I got into comics because I wanted to tell stories, and I right. and I enjoyed telling stories. So if I had to choose between the two, I'm much more interested in somebody reading the stuff, reading the work, and being interested in that than I am uh, uh, having them interested in my life. Yeah. And I also know me well enough to know that as as much as I would love somebody doing a New York Times uh, interview, uh, what you need, 22 things you need to know about Brad Geiger. You know, I'd love that. I sit right down. I'll give you 23. You can cut uh, the day after 25 hours after that runs having people uh, uh, a number one, no 22 things about me. And number two, at, you know, then, then there's the reaction. Well, I don't agree with number 15, Brad, you know, likes chocolate milkshakes. And I think vanilla milkshakes are the way to go. You know, I, uh, I having people comment on my life, uh, would drive me crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, it's it's bad enough when they comment on my comic. Cause you know, yeah. just sit there, read it, and like it. That's my perfect world. So <laughs> having them comment on me uh, would drive me up the wall. You know what? I didn't even consider that. That I really enjoy the privacy aspect of comics. Yeah, and I, I forgot yeah. to mention that. You're right. That I like that no one knows for the most part about my private life unless I wanted to share it with them. Um, right. I and see you're in control actor friends. Of that. It's it's misery to to yeah. live a, a truly public life. I mm -hmm. do not wish that on anyone. I uh, they make a lot of money, my actor friends, but I yeah. don't want to walk that path. It's miserable to not be able to walk into an ice cream shop and get an ice cream without people going photographs, photographs. Oh look, oh you go, are these your kids? Oh, oh, oh. And you're like I don't want any of that. That's very very yeah. invasive in your life. I anyway. Yes. So yes, I am with you on that. I as much as I would love the profile, I like the privacy and the ability to to go quiet on my life. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Dave, I've got one more to end the show with, and this is a, a $5 question that comes in through Patreon from Eric, who says, hi guys, thank you so much for all of your advice over the years. I find a little extra motivation in every show. My question today is a spin on a prior topic, but from a different perspective, the reader, not the creator. Your discussion on a recent show about handling negative responses to a comic made me wonder, when do we or when should we, as readers, jump in and defend a creator? Should we, as fans or readers, take our cue from the creator and not give those critics any steam? Or should we jump in on behalf of the creator and take those other readers to task and let them know uh, what we think about this situation. What does the creator want? Do they want us to stay out of it or jump into it? Now, that's the question, Dave. There's, there's, uh, I'll, I'll set the scene for you. Somebody's discussing your comic, let's say in Patreon, and they've got a negative thing to say. Do you want the, those other readers to jump in and defend you, or do you want them to stay out of it? This is a great question. Uh, it, it, the The answer doesn't sound friendly, but I think it's still true. Is that I would rather people. I would. I always want to be able to speak for myself, and I don't want others to speak for me. Right. I I love the idea that people want to defend me, or want to speak on my behalf, or want to. Um, to, uh, you know, say, oh, maybe you don't know the artist's intentions or whatever that. But I, I, I that's such a slippery slope for me, because frankly, nine times out of 10, I dis I dislike the reaction as much as I dislike the accusation or dislike the, the questioning of the original person. What I'm getting at is I wish people would just let me answer for myself. And sometimes it's a very, very intentional silence on my part, because have you ever been insulted by someone, Brad, in real life? And you do not <laughs> respond. You just maintain eye contact because then the insult hangs in the air, right? It's almost yeah. disarming for a fight because they have nothing to escalate with. And then they, right. they realize how stupid or how aggressive they sound and they kind of back off. Um, silence is an incredible weapon. It's really helpful. And so when other people are like <laughs> jumping in going, you don't know Dave Keller, Dave Keller. I'm like, quiet, quiet. Everybody, shh, shh. Everybody go, go, shh. Calm down, calm down, shh. I, I, my reaction was going to be silence. And so whether yeah. it's a critique or whether it's this or that, I I really like to, to speak for myself on that. Um, I do not like, nor do I necessarily trust other people to speak on my behalf. Not trust in a, yeah. like a, in a malevolent way, but trust in a like, I, I those are not the words I would have chosen. That is not the argument that I would have chosen to make, all that sort of thing. How about you? What Do you like it when readers chime in for you? 
uh, there are certain situations, and I want to emphasize that, certain situations where I actually count on it. In other words, if there's something going on and it's a low level thing, like, like, like not to the extent of anger, more of like a nitpick or something, you know, something where somebody's coming in in a pedantic way and saying, well, you know, last Tuesday he had a, this character say that she enjoyed hamburgers and today she's saying that she doesn't like hamburgers. She prefers hot dogs. You know, what's going on? And, you know, and, and it's right. that kind of low level. Uh, it, it doesn't rise to the level of actually having an effect on anything. It's more, again, pedantic type of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually uh, re re prefer somebody to uh, somebody else to jump in on that, because if I do it, uh, I, I, number one, it, it's it's never going to come off with the right tone. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's one of those things that it's it's going to look like um, I'm touchy. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all, no matter what I say, it's going to be the wrong thing to say. It's something that uh, I cannot engage in because it's going to make me look either thin skinned or it's going to make me look like I, I can't let something go. And, and, and I would just as soon somebody else come in and say, well, you know, you know, whatever they say, I don't care the hamburgers and hot dogs, who cares? Uh, the low lying stuff, I kind of count on some of my members to jump in and be the voice of reason or to right. say, or, you know, to, to kind of settle things down. And I, and I've got a number of readers who, uh, especially in my Patreon, that I that I literally count on for that, where, where somebody will say something and somebody else will say, nah, come on, just enjoy the strip, <laughs> you know, which is kind of what I'm like. It's like, come on, hot hamburgers and hot dogs. What are we talking about here? There's a bigger right, storyline. Right, right, right. Uh, for something with anger in it, then yeah, silence is the best. I just, anything that things are starting to get heated up, I would just as soon have that fizzle out and there's right. no way to fizzle that out by engaging in it. Again, we've told you in the past, best way to handle some of this stuff is to cut the oxygen off and to starve it, you know, like a fire, you know, mm -hmm. you don't give that fire anything to burn. Uh, you just let it fizzle out. Uh, but for low lying stuff. Yeah. I kind of count on some of the members of my community to do almost self policing <laughs> where it's like, uh, and I've seen it happen before where they say, all right, Let's keep it polite. You know, let's keep this, uh, let's keep this uh, in going with uh, good feelings and so forth. I count on them for that. Uh, but for the bigger stuff, uh, then it's, then it, then I would appreciate just a, a full stop. Does that make sense? It's, 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 in other words, for me, it's more of a sliding scale. Yeah. I, and you know what, maybe introducing the idea of a sliding scale is helpful because you're right with small stuff, with pedantic stuff, with spelling errors or repeated yeah. small plot point things that they're critiquing on. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'd be okay with someone being like, Oh no, it's fine. I do appreciate. And I, I appreciate, and I encourage helpfulness mm -hmm. whenever someone, a reader says like, Hey, I don't remember when did this character say this or when did this happen? Or I don't remember that ship blowing up or whatever this is. And another reader chimes in with like the page this and the exactly link. exactly what I'm talking about. I yes. actively reinforced that that was a kindness that I appreciate that. That's, that's yes. the community helping one another. So that yeah. I actively reinforce. Right. But if, if someone critiques me on something and I'm like, nah, you can't please everybody. Who, what are you going to do? Right. But then 19 people jump on it and like, don't, don't you dare attack Dave Kelly. He's a little sweetheart. And I'm like, all right, everybody, shh, shh, stop talking, stop talking, stop talking. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I, that I do not want and I do not need. I'm a grown adult. I don't need people to stand yeah. up for me. Um, yeah. If I've made a mistake, I'll try to, I, I would rather me answer for it than someone else put either false or misleading or or incorrect words into my mouth. Like, I'm sure what Dave meant to say is, I'm always like, oh God, no, stop <laughs> yeah. saying that. You don't know what Dave meant to say, you know? So I I actively do not like it when people speak on my behalf or or defend me or, or uh, I don't know. I really encourage community helpfulness and yeah. uh, conversation amongst the community, but boy, I do not like it when people... Um, uh, basically become uh, a, a spokesperson for on my behalf without, with, you know, by self-nomination. Like, I, I'm like, no one yeah. asked you to do this. Why are you doing this? But, <laughs> but if you recognize, even like looking at it positively, if you recognize the joy and the love behind it, what they're saying is, I love this cartoonist or I love this right. comic strip or I love this piece of work and how dare you attack this or how dare you critique this or, or I get it. I know where that's coming from. It's coming from a place yeah. of love and kindness. So I don't even try to critique that. Like, I get what they're doing and I, I tend to go silent but nothing makes me more 
frustrated <laughs> than when someone critiques somebody by adding me on Twitter, right? And then five <gasps> oh. other people have are, are jumped to my defense. And then I'm stuck in a Twitter thing for like two days where they're arguing about what I intended. And I, by God, I'm not chiming into that thing, but I'm added yeah. on in for the next two days. And I'm like, please stop talking. What are you doing? Please, yeah. Anyway. Please don't at me on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's one thing that I know that Dave Kellett would say if he were here. He'd say, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my pal Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my good friend Dave Kellett, fresh back from a wonderful week in Big Bear, co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. And a huge shout out and a thank you to our sponsors for this week, Wacom and the makers of the Wacom One at WACOM.com. And the Comic Cloud theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like Dave Kelly kayaking with wasps. Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. Oh, God. We're having family fun. We're not going back to the shore. Oh, everyone keep paddling. This is fun. Oh, oh God. Dave, I got to tell you that video that you sent me biking in Big Bear was funny. I don't, I don't realize, I don't know if you realize just how out of breath you were. I mean, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you thought you were making words, but it was like, "Hello, Brad, I." <laughs> we're biking up here in Big Bear, and your face was turning red. Your eyes were bulging out. Uh, it was, it was. <laughs> It was really something else. It was my best Abbott and Costello impersonation. There's nothing like taking an, a, a slightly out of shape asthmatic, sticking yeah. him on a bike trail at six or 7,000 feet where the oxygen is less and saying, go with yeah. God, have fun, get, get to bike riding. <laughs> and I, at some point I realized that I was breathing so hard that I was like, I got to send Brad a video because this is ridiculous. Brad, look at how much fun I'm having in Big Bear, biking up this trail at 6,000 feet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, you. <laughs> Not knowing what season it was, it was a good thing that there weren't any asthmatic mooses out there. <laughs> Misunderstanding the call, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or kindly handing me albuterol with their little moose antlers. Here you go, friend. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>